ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه والتابعين لهم باحسان الى يوم الدين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته ان شاء الله تعالى we're going to be it's not the right time to lose my voice Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be doing the tafsir of some short surah of the Qur'an. And in the last lesson, we finished the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. And <clears throat> in today's lesson, we're going to do Surah Al-Ikhlas. Now, Surah Al-Ikhlas is the, one of the shorter surahs of the Qur'an. <clears throat> and Surah Al-Ikhlas has many names. The first name of Surah Al-Ikhlas is Al-Ikhlas. Is Al-Ikhlas. Now, why was Surah Al-Ikhlas called Al-Ikhlas? Which means sincerity, purity. So there's <coughs> many reasons. Number one, <coughs> Surah Al-Ikhlas comes from the word Ikhlas. And this word Ikhlas has many meanings in the Arabic language. The first meaning is sincerity. Is sincerity. Ikhlas means sincerity. Because this surah is, when you recite this surah, it's like your ibadah is sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like you're professing your sincerity in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the first meaning of the word Ikhlas. The second meaning of it is it comes from the word khalis, which means purity. And this surah was something that was purely speaking about Allah. There is no other subject matter regarding surah al-ikhlas except Allah. All it does is speak about Allah and His names and His attributes, and that's it. It does not speak about the stories of the people of the past. It doesn't speak about rulings halal and haram. All it's speaking about is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third reason is called ikhlas. It comes from the word ukhrisat, singled out, to single out something. So this surah was singled out with the mentioning of Allah. It's similar to the first meaning. Okay, so ikhlas, the word ikhlas mean has three meanings. Number one, sincerity. Number two, purity. And number three, singled out. And all of these meanings are relatively the same. And this surah is one of the surahs that has a sabab nuzul a reason why the surah came down, a cause, a reasoning behind it. Now, certain surahs have a sabab nuzul and certain surahs don't. This surah does. There was a reason why it came down. For example, Surah Al-Fatiha. Was there a particular reason why the surah came down, why it was revealed? Huh? No, it just came down. Allah decided to send it down like that. There are certain surahs that had a reasoning behind them. From them is this surah, Surah Al-Ikhlas. What's the reasoning behind it? It's mentioned in the Hadith of Ubayy ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu, and the mushrikeen qalu li rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, unsub lana rabbak. That the polytheists, they said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, unsub lana rabbak. And nasab is the family tree. So they came to the Prophet and they said, we have our gods, our idols, and they have a lineage. Their idols were based on righteous people. And these righteous people were people who had a lineage. They said, what's the lineage of your Lord Allah? What is his lineage? And some of the narrations mention, Sif lana rabbak. Describe your Lord to us. They said, describe who Allah is. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, Qul hu Allahu ahad, Allahu samad. It's narrated in Jami' al -Tirmah. So it has a reason why it came down. What's the reasoning? The questioning of the Kuffar of Quraysh. They said, who is Allah? And when the Kuffar of Quraysh asked this question, who is Allah? Were they sincere? Were they genuine? Or were they being stubborn? And stubborn. And this is how they were. They were not genuine. They came mockingly asking the Prophet, Okay, 
We say Allah, 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 worship Allah. Who is this Allah? Tell us his lineage. Tell us how he looks like. Tell us his description. And that's when the surah came down. And this is something they were known to do. And that's what Allah says in the Quran. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُ اسْجُدُوا لِلرَّحْمَانِ قَالُوا وَمَا الرَّحْمَانِ When Allah said, prostrate to Ar-Rahman Allah, they said, who is Ar-Rahman? Who is this Ar-Rahman? We don't know him. They said it mockingly. They said it in a stubborn way, in an arrogant way, awkward way. That's how they said it. And they said, the only Rahman we know is Ar-Rahman of Al-Yamama, meaning Musaylam al kadhab the false prophet. So we don't know any other Rahman. So they said it in a stubborn way. So Allah revealed these surahs, or this surah itself. Now this is the sabab al nuzul Number three is, does this surah have a virtue? We mentioned Surah Al-Fatiha, and Surah Al-Fatiha had many virtues. We had mentioned six virtues of Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Ikhlas, is there a virtue? Anything else? Is in the Quran all of it Ruqya? Uh, yes, but specifically the, the, the past three surahs. Now, so this is a part of the Mu'awwidatayn. Mu'awwidatayn means the two things that were used to seek refuge, which we will see in Surah Al-Nas and Surah Al-Falaq. <coughs> but sometimes this surah is added as a part of it and it's called Mu'awwidatayn, but it's actually three surahs. Falaq, Al-Nas and Ikhlas. So it's used to seek refuge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And <coughs> as the brother mentioned, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions in the hadith of Abi Darda, mentioned in Imam Muslim Sahih, where he said to his companions, ahadukum? Is any one of you unable to, ayajizu, unable to, read an yaqra fi laylatin in one night thuluth al-Qur'an, a third of the Qur'an? He said to the companions, has anyone unable to? Is anyone unable to? Is anyone finding it hard? Is anyone struggling to read a third of the Quran every night? So when the Prophet said this to the companions, shukka alayhim, it became hard. They said the third is a lot. If you think of the Quran, how many pages is it? Roughly 600 pages, right? So 300 pa- uh, third is 200 pages every night. So they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, وَكَيْفَ يَقْرَأُ ثُلُّ الْقُرْآنِ How can one read a third of the Qur'an? Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ تَعَذِلُ ثُلُّ الْقُرْآنِ This surah, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ equates to a third of the Qur'an. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولِدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدْ Third of the Qur'an, reward you get just by reciting those verses. Now, two things regarding this. Number one, why was it that Surah Al-Ikhlas was equal to a third of the Qur'an? What's the other two thirds? Just general Ikhlas, so like the Ibrahim and previous prophets, and the Ahkam. Ahsent. So if you look at the Qur'an, the main subject matter of the entire Qur'an, if you take a bird's eye view of the Qur'an, you understand that the Qur'an speaks about three main topics. Number one, Allah and His names and attributes. A large portion of the Qur'an is what? Speaking about Allah and His names and attributes. And this is every single surah, almost you will find <coughs> a part of it speaking about Allah and His names and attributes. Number two, it speaks about ahkam, rulings, halal and haram. <coughs> do this, don't do that. Do this and don't do that. So a part of it is ahkam, halal and haram. And a third of the Qur'an is qasas, stories of the people of the past. The story of Musa, the story of Isa, the story of a lot of the different things that happened in the past, the story of what is going to happen in the future on the day of judgment, a lot of incidents and stories. So from that angle, what is it? A third, because this surah only speaks about Allah. So from that angle, it's a third of the Qur'an. Now, important point. Now, if I pray my salah, I say, Allahu Akbar, 
And I don't recite anything except Surah Al-Fatiha three times. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ اللَّهُ الصَّبَدْ لَمْ يَرِدْ وَلَمْ يُولِدْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفْرٌ أَحَدٌ Three times. What have I read? The whole Qur'an. Can I just pray like that? Why not? Isn't, if I read it three times, it's like the whole Qur'an, right? And in the whole Qur'an, is Surah Al-Fatiha not in it? خلاص, الحمد لله رب العالمين. I recite the Surah Al-Fatiha and more, the whole Qur'an. Is that not enough? Huh? Yes, without Fatiha. Well, I have one third, one third, one third, but it becomes a whole Quran. Includes the Fatiha in it, doesn't it? Oh, you mean, okay, it's just the edge of the. Uh, just the edge of so what, what does it mean then? Uh, as if you read it. As if I read it. Alhamdulillah. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, So, it's a third in the Quran. It's a third of the Qur'an in the terms of the reward you get from it, but it doesn't compensate and suffice you from having to read the whole Qur'an. Now, for example, we know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, whoever prays Salat al-Fajr, and then he sits in his majlis, in his place, and does not move and does not talk to anyone and remembers Allah until the sun rises and then prays to Raka'ah. What's the reward? Like a Hajj and an Umrah, a complete Hajj and a complete Umrah. If somebody's never done Hajj and they do this action after Fajr, they don't move, they sit, they remember Allah. Sun comes up, they pray to Rakah. Can we say you don't have to do Hajj? Khalas, Hajj is done. Alhamdulillah. Huh? Or, for example, based on the opinion that Umrah is wajib, somebody doesn't have to do Umrah. They don't have to go to Mecca. Just go to Medina, make wudu in your house or in the hotel. Go to Masjid Quba and pray to Rakaat. You get the reward of what? A complete Umrah, right? Khalas. Don't have to go to Mecca, just stay in Medina. Can we say that? No. Why? This is fil jazai la fil ijzai. It is in the reward you get out from it. It doesn't compensate and make up for the whole Quran. Is that clear for everyone? Good. Now, another issue is what's better? For me to read the Surah Al-Ikhlas three times <clears throat> and get the reward of reading the whole Qur'an or actually reading the whole Qur'an from cover to cover. What's better? Not more in reward, what's better? Cover to cover, you're going to cover Surah Al-Ikhlas as well. Miss once, right? Reading the Qur'an cover to cover, you get the so the difference is if you read Surah Al-Khlas three times, there's a set number of huruf, letters that you're reading. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, for every letter you read, you have ten hasana. وَلَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ أَلِفْ لَا مِيمْ حَرْفُ وَلَكِنْ أَلِفْ مُنْ حَرْفٌ وَلَا مُنْ حَرْفٌ وَمِيمْ مُنْ حَرْفٌ Every letter is ten rewards. So you have a set number of letters you're reading in Surah Al-Ikhlas as opposed to the whole Qur'an. So many more letters you have, the more reward you get. Plus, let alone the meanings that you get to reflect upon throughout the whole Qur'an. There's different meanings that you will come across. Plus, you're spending more time on reading the whole Qur'an. More effort, more reward. But yes, with that being said, even if you still read Surah Al-Ikhlas three times, you will get the reward of reading the whole Qur'an. Reward not compensation, and does not make up for reading the whole Qur'an. Does everybody understand? Okay. So that is Surah Al-Ikhlas. And this again shows us two, two main things. Number one is not to belittle any good action in Islam. As the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا Do not belittle any good deed. Someone might say Surah Al-Ikhlas three times. It's small, small, it's too small for me. What do we say? Do not belittle any good deed. And number two, this shows you Fadlul Islam, the virtue of Islam. The fact that there is, with small action, such a great reward. This shows you the, the, the unique setting point of Islam. You don't find this in other religions, where you can do small actions and get such a big reward out of it. Just sort of the class three times, how long does it take? Minutes. So minutes, even if it's not minutes, and perhaps not even, one minute, right? It might take you to read that. Without, you get such a big reward. 
shows you the virtue of al Islam. <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah, and by the way, do you, we, didn't, uh, we, we mentioned only one name for Surah Al-Ikhlas, right? There's, this, there's two more names of Surah Al-Ikhlas. The second name of Surah Al-Ikhlas is Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad. Just that. Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad is the name of the surah. So you can say Surah to Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad. Now, where did they get this from? This name, where does it come from? You mentioned last lesson about the names of the surah. They divide, they split into three. So it's no, but where, where does this surah name come from? It's the surah. It's, in the, it's, in the, it's the first ayah of the surah, right? How does the surah start? So the name of the surah is based on the first ayah. And this is very common. It's very common that scholars and the Sahaba, they name surahs based on the first ayah. And the last name of the surah is Allahu al Wahid al Samad. Allahu al Wahid al Samad. And this was narrated in the hadith of Abi Sa'id al Khudri from Sahih al Bukhari. The same hadith that we have regarding Abi Dada, regarding what the Prophet said, Ayajiz Ahadikum. The same thing, but the Prophet وسلم, said, Suratu. Allahu al Wahidu al Samad. Now, side benefit. There is another surah in the Quran which also has the name Al Ikhlas. Besides this one. Is it Surah Zumar? No. There's another surah in the Quran that's also called Surah Al Ikhlas and it's not Qul Hu Allah Wahid. Who knows it? Yunus. No. I'll give you a hint. It's close to Surah Al Ikhlas. Is it Bayina? No. Much closer. Surah Al Kafirun. Qul ya ayyuh al Kafirun, la a'abudu ma ta'abudun. This Surah is also called Surah Al Ikhlas. Okay, why? Because you're freeing yourselves from the Mushrikeen and sincerely making your ibadah for Allah. But it's a less common name of the Surah, of Surah Al Kafirun. In any case, these are the three names of the surah. Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad, and Surah Allahu Al-Wahid Al-Samad. Now the surahs, they are, the names are given sometimes based on the ayat, beginning ayat, sometimes based on the subject matter, sometimes based on the word that is found in the surah. Now this surah, Al-Ikhlas, is the word Al-Ikhlas found in the surah? No, but it's still called Al-Ikhlas. Majority of the surahs in the Quran, the naming comes from a word in the surah. For example, Ar Rahman is the name of the surah. Is the word Ar Rahman found in the surah? Yes. Al Hadid is the name of the surah. Is the word Hadid found in the surah? Yes. Al Baqarah is the name of the surah. Is it found in the surah? Yes. A lot of the times, the name of the surah can be found in the surah itself. But it's not always the case, like we see in Surah Al Ikhlas. And a lot of the times, the surah's name is based on the subject matter, the main subject matter. And sometimes not. Sometimes it's not even based on the main subject matter. It's based on a story or incident that stands out in the surah. For example, Surah Al-Baqarah is called Surah Al-Baqarah. Now, is the main subject matter of Surah Al-Baqarah the cow and the story of the cow? No, that's just a small portion mentioned in the beginning. The main concept of it is a lot. There's a lot of main topics regarding its submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and many other topics. But it's still called Baqarah. So again, the point is, the naming of the surahs, they come from different ways. And just because a surah's name doesn't follow a particular pattern, we can't say, oh no, this is not the name of the surah. Where do we get the names of the surahs from? Who gives it to us? How do we determine it? <coughs> yeah. uh, the Sahaba. And the scholars of Islam. So there's different ways. Sometimes the Prophet وسلم, will give it the name. For example, Al Baqarah, Ali Imran was given by the Prophet. وسلم. And sometimes the Sahabas will give it a name, the companions will give it a name. And the Prophet will remain quiet and confirm what they said. And sometimes there's a name given by scholars that come later on, like the Qurra. Sometimes the scholars of Qur'at, or your Qur'an teacher, they will say, read uh, 
for example, um, Alam Tara Kaifa. Now, is, is this Surah Al Fil called Alam Tara Kaifa? No, it's not the name, it's the way that the Quran, the people who recite the Quran, they will tell you to read it. Now, so it's not necessarily the name officially given, but they can refer to it that way. And we also mentioned another benefit, which is the names of the Surah can be given in three ways. Meaning you can refer to the name in three ways. Either, number one, you say Surah something. For example, Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran. Number one. Number two, you can remove the surah. You can just call it Al-Baqarah, Ali Amran, Al-Ikhlas. Number three, you can say a surah alladhi yuthkaru fiha al-Baqarah. The surah in which the cow is mentioned. And all of those are ways that you can refer to a name of the surah. In any case, I digress. Let's go back to the topic. Surah Al-Ikhlas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the surah by saying, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ Qul means what? Say. It's a qaf, not a kaf. It's not kul eating. Qul, say. Say what? Allah, he, Allah, he is ahad. Now, let's break it down. This word qul, number one, is it a part of the surah? Yes, no doubt about it. The word qul is a part of the surah. There are people who've come along and said, no, 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 the word qul in the beginning of the surah is not a part of the surah. That's the statement of Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam should have started the surah from huwa Allahu ahad. And this qul is not a part of it, we say no. Uh, the the ijma' of the scholars is what? This is the surah. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, the qul is a part of the surah. And some of the scholars even say, Jibreel alayhi salam said to the Prophet, قُلْ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ Oh Muhammad, say, say, Allah is Ahad. Okay, so no doubt about it, it is a part of the surah. Second issue regarding the qul. Who is this for? When Allah says say, who is Allah telling to say? Who is this reference to? It's addressing the Prophet ﷺ, but it's removed, it's still going to us as well, even if it's directed. Tim Bazaar said to the people who came to him and asked him. So, so we, don't, we don't have to say Qul Allah No, no, we do. Okay. Uh, the, the why came down. So that's why. But does it apply to us or does it only apply to the Prophet? Or does it apply to both? All of us. So the scholars have a difference of opinion. Now, this Qul, when it is mentioned in the Quran, Sometimes it does refer to the Prophet. Allah is telling the Prophet to say. Okay? And sometimes Allah is telling us to say. And sometimes both of us to say. For example, uh, the ayah in Surah Al Isra when Allah says, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا إِنَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُمَّا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا Uff. Do not say uff. Now here, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا Do not say. This statement of do not say is for who? The scholars in, are in agreement, it's not for the Prophet. It's for everyone else besides the Prophet. What does the ayah say? If one of you, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that you are kind to your parents, and if any one of them reach an old age, do not say oof to them. Now, why can this not apply to the Prophet? Close. Is Prophet Sallallahu parents passed away? Oh, I was going to say, it's right? You're close, you're very close. No, it's the fact that the, did the Prophet witness his parents reach an old age for him to have that chance to say it? Of course not, right? The Prophet Sallallahu parents died when he was young. So he could never have gotten a chance to actually say of to his parents. So it doesn't apply, the statement is not for the Prophet. Even though some scholars they say this statement applies to everyone, including the Prophet, it just happened so that the Prophet never got the opportunity or that never reached the Prophet that time. In any case, that qul does not apply for the Prophet. In this ayah, qul hu Allah wahad, who is it for? We say it is for the Prophet. It is for the Prophet. But it also applies to all of us Muslims as well. So generally and directly, this statement is for the Prophet. 
But it applies to us today as well. So Allah is telling us also to say, Allah is Ahad. Okay, but it also applies to the Prophet directly. So applies to the Prophet directly, but by extension, it's also a statement for us as well. Who Allah Ahad? Who is what? It's a pronoun, al Amir. Who does it go back to? Allah. And who is it a name of Allah? Is it an ism of Allah? No, it's not a name of Allah. Okay? It's just a pronoun. It's just a pronoun. Who Allah Ahad? Allah, we mentioned in Surah Al Fatiha, where does it come from? Al Ilah. Al Ilah. So the word Allah was originally Al Ilah, the one worthy of worship. Al Ilah. But because of the constant use by the Arabs, instead of saying Al Ilah, Al Ilah, Al Ilah, Al Ilah, it became easier for the Arabs to just say Allah. They dropped the Hamza, the Lam and the Lam, they merged them to together, Adham, and it became Allah. So the word originally was Al Ilah. Al Ilah means what? Al Ma'bud, the one that is worshipped. Just like Firash means Al Mafrush. Bisaq means Al Mabsud. Al Ilah means Al Ma'lu, the one that is worshipped. So that is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of the scholars they say Allah's name, Allah is the greatest name of Allah. And this name Allah, all of Allah's names return back to it. So we say Al Jabbar is Allah, Al Kareem is Allah, Al Rahman is Allah. We cannot say Al Rahman is Al Jabbar or Al Jabbar is Al Kareem. No, all of the names of Allah return to the name Allah. That is Allah. Ahad. What does the word Ahad mean? One. Is that Ahad or Wahid? What does the word Ahad mean? Huh? Does Wahid refer to Zatiya, so he's single in his essence, and Ahad is he's unique and single in terms of his personal sifat? Where did you get that from? The ulama. Which Ahad? Um, I've never heard of that, but that's a good explanation. I think I've heard of the same thing. So what's the difference between Wahid and Ahad? Allah says, Qudhu Allahu Ahad. Allah is Ahad. Allah did not say, say Allah is Wahid, one. So what is Ahad and Wahid? Is there a difference? Or are they the same? Huh? Both of them have the root word and they have the meanings of oneness and uniqueness. Okay? So Ahad and Wahid both mean one and unique. The only difference is Wahid is more of an emphasis on the meaning of oneness, one. As opposed to Ahad is more of an emphasis on the meaning of uniqueness. But both of them, they have that meaning, so the two meanings of one and unique. Except Wahid has more of an emphasis on the quantity, one, and Ahad has more of an emphasis on the uniqueness. So in English you can say the uniquely one or the one that is unique in his oneness. However you want to translate it. English, this is what English falls short and it's hard to translate. But the one that is uniquely one or one in his uniqueness. Okay? So this, there is a difference except the difference is what? On the emphasis of the word. Now, what is Allah uniquely one in? Allah is uniquely one in His majesty, in His glory, in His names, in His attributes, in His beauty, in His generosity, in His mercy, in all of His Allah's attributes. Allah is uniquely one. There is no one who has the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mercy of Allah is unlike the mercy of anyone else. The glory of Allah is unlike the glory of anyone else. The might and the authority and the power of Allah is like no one else. Allah is unique in it. So Allah is Ahad. And this concept of Allah is Ahad, and if you look at it from the meaning of oneness, is only found in Islam. There is no other religion or way of life that believes Allah is one. They always fall short in different aspects of it. Whatever religion you take, Judaism, Christianity, they always fall short in those meanings. Now, would somebody say Judaism, don't they believe in one God? mentions that they took the rabbis as the So even though they believe there is one God, but to them God is not just one. Because they took what? The monks and the rabbis as Arbab and Mindunillah. As things they worship and they went back to 
just like the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, so this concept can never be seen except in Al Islam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu as samad. Allah is as samad. As samad is what? If a person says, low job, low job, low. What does that mean? There's no, he's getting hollow, no stomach. Okay, what does that mean? He doesn't eat or drink. I see. So there's different tafsir of the word as samad that has come in the Quran. Or, or in the Afghan tafsir of the scholars. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, the great professor, Hadru al Ummah, Turjuman al Quran, he himself has different opinions regarding the word as One of the common meanings, as Ibn Jarir al Qadr he brings in his tafsir, is as Sayyid al Kamil al Maqsud al Fi Qadai al Hawaij. As Sayyid al Kamil, the complete master that everybody goes back to when they need something or in times of need. Or you can say the self sufficient master. As Sayyid al Kamil, the master that is self sufficient. Meaning Allah is not in need of anything. Not in need of me, not in need of you. But us human beings, when we need something, or anyone else, the animals and the, and, and the creation of Allah, if they need anything, who do they go back to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what the word as samad means. As Sayyid al Kamil, the one that is a complete master, that everybody goes back in order to. Satisfy their needs. That is one meaning of the word as summit. Another meaning of the word as summit, as our brother has mentioned, is something that is hollow. And this is the tafsir of Ibn Abbas and many other companions. And what this means is that Allah is not in need of food or drink. Allah is not in need of food and drink. And there's other tafsir as well, but this will suffice for now. Which one? No, you can say that. So, a Sayyid means the self sufficient master. So, everything that Allah has created is in need of Allah. Now, is the Arsh in need of Allah? Yes. Is the heavens in need of Allah? Yes. Are the humans in need of Allah? Yes. Are the jinn kind in need of Allah? Yes. Is everything in need of Allah? Yes. Everything needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does Allah need anyone? No. Yeah. So that's the word uh, as samad. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lam yalid wa lam yulid. Lam yalid means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not born. Allah was not born. Allah did not have a starting point. Allah had no source. Allah did not begin to exist. Allah had no starting point. And that's what the word Lam Yalit. And it's the difference between Lam Yalit and La Yalit. What's the difference? Allah could have said La Yalit wa La Yulit. But Allah chose to say Lam Yalit wa Lam Yulit. Does Lam refer to present tense? So it doesn't negate the fact that it could have happened in the past. Whereas Lam is mm-hmm. the past and yeah, continuous. Ah, so, uh, so. I was going to say the same thing with the Lam is used. Lam, you feel, you feel your istimrar. Lam shows you it happen, it's happening all the time. Lam yalid means Allah was never in the past ever started existing. Meaning Allah had never, was never born in the past. Allah will never be born in the future and Allah is never born right now. It's always the case. And it's always been the case Allah was Lam yalid, was never born. And Lam yalid, and this concept of Lam yalid, and then walam yulad, which means what? Allah has no offsprings. Allah has no children. And this has always been the case. In the past, in the future, and in the present, Allah does not have a son. Allah does not have a daughter. Allah has not given birth to anything. And this concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not giving birth and Allah not having children, it refutes every other religion that says Allah has a son. It refutes the concept of the Christians. That Isa is the son of Allah. What does Allah say? It's not befitting of Allah to do that. So Lam Yalit, Walam Yulit specifically refutes the concept of Christians and the concept of the Jews. 
Raza'il ibn Allah. The Jews said, Raza'il is the son of Allah. Now, does, do the Jews say that? Raza'il is the son of Allah? No. Uh, Allah, it seems like it. They don't say it anymore. But this used to be a prominent belief of the Jews around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Which is why Allah addressed it in the Quran. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُدُ عُزَيْرُ بْنُ اللَّهِ This was the prominent sect of Judaism at that time. So there is a sect of Jews that believe that. Do they believe that today? Not necessarily. And also, all of the polytheists that believe that the angels are the daughters of Allah, it refutes all of those concepts. And both, all of this, the whole ayah, is even a refutation against those who do not believe in Allah. The atheists. Those who don't believe in Allah. Why? Allah says, Hu Allahu Ahad. Allahu As-Samad. This concept of Allah is being one and Allah is there and Allah exists refutes all of these concepts. So, Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulid. Then again, the statement of uh, them saying, Allah has a son, Allah says, Takadu samawati wa tafattarna minhu wa tanshakhu al-ardu wa takhiru al-jibalu hadda and da'u lil-rahmani wa lada. The, the sky is about to split open. The earth is about to break apart. The mountains are about to crumble. Why? Because they said Allah has a son. It's something that is not befitting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lam yalid wa lam yulid. And the meaning of lam yalid, you can say it's in the ayah, huwa al-awwal wal-akhir. Wa dhahiru wal-batin. Allah is al-awwal, the eternal. Al-awwal wal-akhir, the last one. The only one that is, remains to exist is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says, كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانِ وَيَبْقَ وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ And Al-Zahir. Al-Zahir means what? The highest. Al-Batin. The one who knows the hidden affairs of the people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the ayah or the surah by saying, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ And there is no one kufuan to Allah. Al-Kufu is what? What does it mean? Al-Shabih wal Mathil. Anything that is comparable to Allah. There is no one like Allah. There is no one comparable to Allah. There is no one who has similarities to Allah. All of that is rejected in the last ayah. Uh, and Ibn uh, Shaykh Dr.Rahman Nasr al-Sa'di, he says, There is no one like him fi dhatihi wa la fi asma'ihi wa la fi sifatihi wa la fi af'alihi. There is no one like Allah in his essence or his names or his attributes, or even in Allah's actions. These things of Allah are unique. Allah's that, his essence is unique. Allah's names are unique. Allah's attributes are unique, and Allah's actions are unique. Okay? So Allah is unique, and there is no one comparable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last thing, inshallah ta'ala, before we wrap up, is a few benefits regarding the surah. The first benefit, it's a bit of a linguistic benefit, but I'll mention it in a simple way, inshaAllah. In the Arabic language, you have something called a mubtada and a khabar. A subject and a predicate. Okay? A subject and then Allah informs you regarding the subject. Or a subject and somebody informs you about the subject. Now, the first ayah, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ The first part, قُلْ, applies to Allahu أَحَدْ. Right? هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ this word قُلْ, if you keep it, can it apply to the next ayah? Yes. You can say قُلْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ You can apply it to the third ayah as well. قُلْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلِدْ قُلْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفٌ أَحَدْ It is one of the unique and things about this surah. Also, the surah formulates principles for Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah when it comes to the names and attributes of Allah. When it comes to Allah's names and attributes, we affirm them and we negate them. So we affirm and we negate. In this surah you see Allah affirming names and attributes for himself. For example, Allah affirms the name Allah for himself. Allah affirms Al-Ahad, Hadidah. Allah being uniquely one and one and unique. Also Samadiyah. Allah is a Samad, Allah affirms it. So Allah is affirming. At the same time, Allah is also negating. Negating what? Offsprings. Negating birth, negating anything being comparable to Allah. And as like that, in when Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah deal with Allah's names and attributes, what do we do? We affirm and we negate. So when we come to Allah's names, we say, yes, this is the name of Allah. Ar-Rahman is the name of Allah. 
Al-Jabbar is the name of Allah. Al-Kareem is the name of Allah. And we negate, we say this and this and this is not a name of Allah. Huwa is not a name of Allah. At the same time, we affirm attributes. We say Allah has the attribute of mercy. Allah has the attribute of descending. Allah has the attribute of forgiving. Allah has these attributes. And we also negate attributes from Allah. Allah, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. Allah, there's no slumber and sleep that overtakes Allah. We're negating these attributes from Allah. So we affirm and we negate. And when we affirm and we negate, especially when we affirm, we do not liken Allah with His creation. So when we say Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is merciful, we don't say Allah's mercy is like the mercy of a mother or the mercy of a king. We don't we don't compare it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that can be found where? In the last ayah. So the point is, this even though it's a surah of the Quran, you can take principles of asma wa sifat from this surah itself, by itself. Now, inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop here for now. Does anybody have any questions? I said, you know the statement of the ulama said, the full isn't from Allah, but it's from Jibreel. Say that again? You know, you mentioned some of the ulama, they mentioned that full is not the yeah. kalam of Allah, it's kalam of Jibreel. Now, the statement is, it's not considered. Is that in the Sha'ar that he tried to yes. force their views? Yes. Jibreel? Yes. Yeah. He's referring to the belief that of all the senses fully in the Quran. So they'd be all the senses fully in the Quran, so Jibreel. Yeah, that part is not from Allah. That's not from Allah. And they use it as a stepping stone to negate the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, we'll stop here for now, inshaAllah ta'ala. Barakallahu fika for your time. Anything good that I said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any mistakes, any shortcomings, any errors is from me and shaitan. Subhanakallahu wa alhamdulillah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah wa tubulayh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.